Wow. Everybody's pretty excited tonight. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's keep that up. I'm going to probably ruin that. You're all going to be falling asleep pretty soon, but uh, at least we started off good. So, good. Well, today we're starting a new series within the overall series of Light of the World, which is just going verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, but this new mini-series is Temptation and Triumph. Uh, I think all of us as Christians experience both of those. We experience both of those. Uh, last series was identity, and today what we're in is Luke 4, starting at verse 1. But we see the, the final identification of Jesus, and not by God, not by man, but by Satan. And so it's the end of the identity series, but it's the beginning of the temptation and triumph series. Because for Jesus, it is all triumph. And for us who are a part of the kingdom of God, we are victors and, and victorious as well. So I'm very excited about this. I am, I'm happy that you guys are here. Man, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on at New Mountain Church. Uh, you know, I didn't want to spend too, too long on this, but uh, we've been pushing to get into this new building. The construction's uh, moving along. Walls are coming down. Dust is in the eyes. It's great. Uh, things are happening. And so... Um, please get involved somehow with this church. It doesn't have to be doing any construction. It doesn't have to be doing anything like that. But in order for this church to exist, people have to be the church, not see church. I, I do not want to be a church where everybody's a watcher, watching somebody talk, watching somebody sing. I don't want none of that. I want us to be the church. Okay? All right. Today, this is called Bait on the Hook. Bait on the Hook. Who loves fishing? Man, there's a bunch of fishers over here. Not so many over here, huh? No? No? How about on the phone? Isn't there a fishing game you can play on the phone? No? All right. Well, what is the point of a lure? As they... To tempt the fish, okay? And so what do they do? They make it look... Appetizing, right? They make it look uh, glittery or, I don't know, John, you're the pro fisher. What do you say? What's the, what's the lure about? Enticing. That's a good word. That's a good word. Enticing. Okay, let me, let me ask you something. Do you guys ever feel guilty when you are tempted? Yes. Yeah? Should you? No, you shouldn't. Because this is the thing, to be tempted is not a sin. To give in to the temptation is a sin. And that's what we're going to look at. With Jesus, he was tempted in the wilderness. That's what we're going to look at today. But he was without sin. There was no sin in. Uh, not yet. John will be towards the end of the message. But now he's, he's giving it away. There's going to be something special at the end of the message. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be. In fact, John, let's just, let's just do it right now. The Lord's wanting this to happen right now, John. Come on. Come back, come back, John, come back. Bring, bring your fishing pole. Bring your fishing pole. Let me read the section that we're going to look at first. Uh, it won't be on the screens. Let me just go ahead and, and read it. The section that we're going to look at is Luke 4, starting at verse 1. It says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And it goes on to say that the, Satan tempts Jesus three different times with three different things. Okay? So let me do an example. This is John, a.k.a. Satan. Sorry. This is my mother's fault. <laughs> so John is an excellent fisherman. Oh, a fisherman. Oh, a fisherman. A mediocre fisherman. <laughs> But John is going to help us to understand what Satan was doing that day. Satan comes up to Jesus and he says, If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Tempting Jesus with food. Although Jesus is without food at this moment. And so it's almost like this. And, and this is the same thing that happens to us. Satan pulls back the... Pulls back the... the uh, no, you go for it. You go for it. A anybody who doesn't want to get hit in the head with something, raise your hand, and he won't fling this at you. Who wants to get hit? 
Somebody needs to catch this sock. Who's going to catch it? There's no hook in it. Somebody needs to catch it. Way back there. Way back there. Did it work? Now hold on to it. Hold on to it. So now he's going to start reeling it in. <laughs> so, so this is what Satan does. He flings it out, but we have to bite, right? We have to bite. Now, what happens when you bite? Yeah, Ken, Ken, walk up here with that. Walk up here with that. So what is happening right now? What is happening? What, what is going on? If, if Ken was a fish, pretend he smelled real slimy like. That's a big fish. <laughs> you see what happened? Satan threw out the tempt. Satan threw out the temptation. The person, Ken, a.k.a. Mr. Fish, bit. And look what happened. Ken came right up to the fisherman. <coughs> Do you understand? This is what happens when we bite we don't get to bite and then go along our happy, merry way. When we bite into sin, we get dragged along by the mouth wherever Satan wants to take us. This is hard stuff. This is really hard stuff because we don't look at sin the way God looks at sin in America. Sin in America is just like, well, I mean, I mean I'm not a serial killer, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm kind of good. I mean, I haven't hurt nobody lately. Worshiping the devil is what is happening when we are sinning. This is hard stuff. This is really hard stuff. So let's go back. Let's look at this. Luke 4, 1 through 2. Let's look at it again. And it says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Look at what happened. In the, in the book of Mark, it says that the spirit drove him out into the wilderness. Some people might think that the wilderness maybe looked like this picture. Nice and green. And there's streams and mountains and probably little fish and rabbits. Oh, and then a Satan. Well, it didn't look like that. In fact, the Judean wilderness looks like this. It looks a lot different. Uh, and in fact, there's more, more than that. There's a lot of jagged, sharp rocks everywhere. In fact, when we would think of Jesus going out into the wilderness, going out for 40 days without food, alone, without anybody, this is probably more what Jesus looked like in the Judean wilderness. This picture almost made me cry when I was finding it for this sermon. Just looking at Jesus... As what Jesus did as he went into this wilderness, being led by the Spirit into this wilderness. You know, and he's fasting. He's, he hasn't eaten anything. Did you know that supposedly, I've never done this, so I'm not an expert, but I've heard that if you go to fast, you can, you can fast for a few days. And after, after a day or two or three, you, you, you get really hungry. You're, you're starving. But then supposedly after a few, like a week or a week and a half, you get to the point where you're actually not hungry anymore. Maybe something happens with your stomach, I don't know what, but you, you kind of get to a point where you're not that hungry. But then as you get closer to this 25, 30, 35 day mark, you have another hunger come upon you. And this is supposedly the death hunger. This is the hunger where your body's saying, Red alert, need food now. And if you don't get food after this hunger, that's your end. That is your demise. That is when you die. And Jesus, he is there for that long. He's in the wilderness, tempted by the devil, in the wilderness, led there by the Spirit. And then he has to deal with what the devil's trying to throw at him? This is something like where, and some of you car guys might know this, but if you're ever building a car, if you're ever building an engine, uh, if you're ever putting in you know, a new radiator, if you're whatever, the only true way to know that your car is built is by taking it on a longer trip. 
You can't just drive it in, in, in town around you know, a few stop signs. You actually got to take it on a long trip to figure out if your car really is ready to go. And Jesus, as fully God, fully man, he's led into the wilderness to fully experience what it's like to be a human at the bottom, at the lowest part of your life, and to be tempted by the devil. He had to take it to the max. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. For us, we can see in the book of Matthew, in, in the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus is helping us to pray, he says in verse six, uh, verse, or chapter 6, verse 13, he says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the prayer for us. Lead us not into temptation. The Spirit led Jesus right there. This verse says, and deliver us from evil. Jesus was up against the prince of darkness in this moment. But there's something that I want to look at. I want to look at a contrast. I want to look at a difference between Jesus and Adam. Adam in the beginning, Genesis, first man, right? Adam. Jesus is always known as the greater Adam. Jesus is always known as the completion of what Adam messed up. And so let's look at this contrast to really see Jesus in this. This is Genesis 2, 8 through 9. It says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put a man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of it, midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he's created everything. He's God's this, this heavenly, magnificent planter, gardener, a botanist. God has created this garden that is beautiful to the eye, that is has food all throughout it, endless amounts of food. He's then placed the man who he formed there. Okay, well, let's look at the next part. Verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the, garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. He's given him a command. God has made it very clear. This is all for you. Every tree out there, every fruit, every single thing that you could want to taste is out there. Everything beautiful, flowers, all these different magnificent plants. Just don't eat that one. Don't eat of that one because you will surely die. Well, let's look at let's look forward into this. This is verse 20 to 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I read that verse many times in weddings. One flesh. Adam was not alone there. Adam was given Eve, this woman. In fact, it, it looks like a heavenly medical procedure happened. <laughs> A deep sleep fell upon Adam as he was laid there. And then out of Adam, God took his rib and from that rib made woman. Now, if I was to look at this in the form of what it takes to refine gold, you know, gold comes from, from ore and it, it, is, it is melted down. But then when you, when you melt it down again, you take out some imperfections. And, that, and so if we look at ourselves as, as beings, as humans, Adam was created out of the dust. He was refined out of the dirt. And then from Adam was refined Eve. So women, 
you guys are twice refined. <laughs> I think that we got to look at this, how God has looked at this. God has, has created this community, this, this cohesiveness of male and female. He's, he's created the, the husband, the wife. He's created man and woman to be one flesh. Okay, I read all that for a, pur- for a purpose. Let's look at what that purpose was. The contrast. Jesus was in a desolate place in Luke 4. But Adam was in a lush garden. In Genesis 2. That's one contrast. Let's look at another one. Jesus had no food while Adam had all he could ever want. That's a second contrast. Let's look at another one. Jesus was alone in that Judean wilderness while Adam had Eve. Very different, very opposite. I think something's going on. There's something that's happening that we need to look at. There's something that's happening. So let's keep going in Luke 4. This is Luke 4, 3 through 4. It says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. This is super deep. This is super deep. (laughs) What? Words that come out of Jesus' mouth are so deep that we got to take a moment and really just look at it, dig into it and look at it. What he's doing right there, what Jesus is doing is battling Satan, not with an axe, not with the Uzi. He's battling Satan with God's word that's sharper than any weapon ever created by man. And the, and the word of God that he's using is Deuteronomy 8.3. And essentially it says this, if you're to look at, at, at the second half of it. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What does 2 Timothy say? 2 Timothy says that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for reproof and correction and for building up in righteousness. All of God's word is mighty and active. And Jesus uses that word as a weapon. But the funny thing is, is that Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. That's pretty awesome. Because if you were to think about it, the the full thing says, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, did you know that Jesus is known as the word? In John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And in fact, at verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the, of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. We've seen in last week's sermon that God called Jesus my son in who I am well pleased. As the spirit came down like a dove at the baptism of Jesus. That word became flesh and dwelt with us. There's sometimes I think, why? Why, How and why did he love us that much to do that? So Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. But Jesus is also the bread. And he says that. Do you remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? He feeds the 5,000, you know, some random Hebrew kid's lunchbox. And Jesus says, Jesus says let's give thanks. And, and he passes it out and, and it just feeds everybody, right? Everybody's fed. Everybody's fed. And then what I want to look at now is, uh, I hope you guys brought your Bibles because we're going to go to a Bible moment right now where it's not going to be on the screen. It's going to be us. Looking at our Bibles, whether it's on your phone or in paper, I hope to hear paper moving or phone screens getting tapped. I want to look at this. This is John 6. Let's go to John 6 and start at verse 26. And we're going to look at a large portion of scripture right here because we need to take in the whole context. We can't just take any verses out of context. We got to look at what the whole thing says. So John 6, starting at verse 26, this is Jesus. He just fed the 5,000. 
crazy miracle and everybody's talking about it. I can't believe what just happened. We have garlic bread. We have sourdough bread. We have all the bread. And Jesus just did it. Just, he gave thanks and just did it. So then, let's look at verse 26. This is John 6, starting at 26. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of God will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, well, what must we do to, to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who, has, who he has sent. So they said to him, uh, then, then, then what sign do you do that, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you. Now listen up. Whenever somebody in the Bible says, truly, truly, I say to you, that's putting like emphasis, big time emphasis on what's being said. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Now, for some of you that know the story of Moses and know the story about manna falling from heaven, they were not supposed to store it up and keep it and pack it into the little little box somewhere so they can pull it out later. Not supposed to fill up their freezers so that they can pull it out later. God wanted them to only eat what, they get, what he gave at that moment and then to trust that God will continue to bring it. They're saying to Jesus right now, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him. Because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say now, I have come down from heaven. And Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who, has, he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they, they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is another contrast to Adam. Adam was told, don't eat this. He did eat it. He then created the fall, which brought death into the world. Where Jesus is saying, do eat my bread and you will have life. Eternal life. It's a stark contrast, but look it. There was something that was said 
If we were to look at, go back and to look at, unless the Father draws them. This is a beautiful piece of scripture. Because Satan is just trying and looking and trying to figure out how to tempt you just right. How to put the perfect sin on the end of his hook and just... And he's a lot better than John. He, he flings that thing right in front of you. He, he's like one of those fly fishermen. They just look so magical as they're fly fishing, right? And, they, and they just fling that, that line right out there. Well, Satan does that same thing. But yet that lure, that sin lands right in front of us so many times. And we're drawn to it, right? It's it's it's. Hour, it's the bait that's specially made for Jeremy. And I, I, I start to get closer to it. And I know that it's probably not good, but I get closer to it. And, and then what happens is then I bite. And what happens is it's not what I thought it was. Because what I thought was going to be something that would make me feel good is actually a hook. That's stuck into my mouth. That don't feel good. You ever been stuck with a hook? Anybody ever got stuck with a hook before? It goes in real easy, don't it? Then you try to pull it out. What happens? Ouch, right? It's designed that way. Goes in real easy. Oh, man. Isn't that what sin is? Oh, it's... I mean, it's just a little... It's not that bad. I mean... I'll repent about it later. <laughs> Goes in real easy, but it sure don't come out that easy. The contrast is the fact that God actually for us, for us to become a, a part of the family of God, for us to become Christians, did you know that you were drawn by him? The father gave us to Jesus. That we were drawn by the Father to him. That it was a, essentially alluring, alluring going on. But there was no hook. There was no plastic fish at the end of it. What was happening is God is luring us into true life. God is bringing us into the family we don't have any, any, any strong you know, reasons why God looks down from heaven and says, oh, Jeremy, he's pretty cool. I mean, he's got dreadlocks and all that. Like, I think, yeah, I think I need a little bit of Jeremy in my family. God don't say that. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that, that I, I've you know, given to that to where God looks at me and says, wow, he's pretty cool. I, I've seen him playing the guitar. Like, that's pretty cool. No, not at all. It's not at all anything that I do. God has brought me into the family. He has drawn me to him. And I would say that he's drawn you as well. So if we were to look then, if we were to go back to Genesis, go back to the beginning, and look at, again at, at one last contrast between Adam and Jesus. This is Genesis 3, 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, uh, We may eat of the fruit of, of, of the trees in the garden. But God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, Ah, oh, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat, it, eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan, questioning Eve about what God said. All Satan had to do was say, was throw some doubt in there, Right? Satan just had to sprinkle in a little bit of the doubt and confusion, like that guy on the internet. I don't even know why he does that, but he sprinkles something. I think it's salt or something. 
Satan's doing that, sprinkling it in to where all we got to do is then to start questioning God ourselves, right? Oh, did God really say that I, I shouldn't do this sin or that sin? Did God really say that I, I have to love my enemies? Did God really say that I, I need to hold fast to my wife? Did God really say that? Look at Jesus withstood the temptation that Satan threw out while Adam fell to it. Jesus, in the most hostile environment imaginable, in fact, even the ancient Hebrews, or even the modern Hebrews today call that place uh, desolation, is what the, what the name of that Judean wilderness is. Adam's in the garden. Satan, or Satan and Jesus are in this place called desolation. <laughs> but yet Jesus withstood Satan and Adam fell. Huh. That is so weird. But that is so like how we are as humans. We could be in the best possible life. Have a good job. Have a great family. Have a car that runs. We could have all this stuff going for us. Health. We could have money in the bank. We could be having it all, but yet fall into sin. Be tempted and then fall into sin. I've got to ask an honest question, and so I'm, I'm praying that you guys will give an honest answer. Do you feel closer to God when everything's going right in your life? Or do you feel closer to God when you're at your rock bottom? Hebrews 2, 17 through 18 says, Therefore he had, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus had to be in the wilderness being tempted by Satan so that he could experience everything that we will be experiencing. Jesus, throughout the whole book of Luke so far, has been doing so many things just to be identified with us. Jesus, fully God, fully man, he has to be truly a man. So essentially, Jesus has to be able to fall in the wilderness. Or else he wouldn't he wouldn't be able to he wouldn't be able to experience what we experience. It had to work out that Jesus could fall, but he didn't. Even though everything was taken from him, realize he Jesus just came from the moment where God ripped apart the heavens and said, "This is my Son, and who I am well pleased." As the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and. It, and everybody's seeing this as, as John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus. It's the, the beginning of his ministry where it's like, wow, like, I'm ready to go. The Spirit's with me. The Spirit's guiding me. And then the Spirit takes me right out into the wilderness. Oh, man. I, I got to say that if you're a Christian in here today and somebody said to you, hey, become a Christian and everything's going to be all Great. All oh, milk and honey in your life. All oh, unicorns and cotton candy. It's going to be awesome. Just, just become a Christian. Your life's just going to be awesome. They lied to you. Because if you're a Christian, you have a bullseye in your back that's pretty big. And Satan knows exactly where to swing that fishing pole. He knows exactly how to fire those fiery darts. For us as Christians, there's times where the Spirit of God takes us into a hard time in life. I know nobody wants to hear that. Our American culture, in a sense, makes me sick sometimes. Because in our, in our American culture, it's so much about wealth and health, and it's so much about how we should be feeling good and, and having good things, and just and, and, and everything should be working out in our lives. Well, we don't see that in, in almost any of the apostles. We don't see that in the early churches. They were getting persecuted left and right. 
As Nero was lighting his garden with burning Christians that were wearing wax shirts so that they would burn longer. But today, today we're supposed to have everything we want. We're supposed to have all the, the jewelry, all the cars, all the houses, all the health that we want. But t- today we're different? No. There's times in our lives, listen, there's times in our lives where the Spirit of God is going to lead us out into a wilderness that doesn't feel good. It's not a camping trip. There's no tents involved. There's no RVs. We are going to be led out into a wilderness in life where God is is putting us into a position where we are actually tested, where we're actually tested coming up against evil. There is so much evil in this world. In fact, we're going to look into that more next week with the prince of the power of the air, the the king of darkness, the one who has control, so to speak, of the world right now. Him, he has strongholds all over this globe. And for for any any Christian here today who's experienced what it means to be, to come up against evil, a demon or darkness, you know that there's, there's a, there's a time where it could be very scary, but, but if you truly know who you are, like Jesus truly knew who he was, we can handle whatever comes out in the wilderness, whatever darkness creeps out from behind a rock. We're we're ready for it. We'll be ready for it because, because true Christians are ready for it. And that's what I want for us at New Mountain Church to be ready for it. Because as soon as we walk out into our wildernesses, we're going to come up against crazy stuff. And some people are going to crumble and fall. I pray that New Mountain Christians will be the Christians that stand up and are ready to go. Ready to go. To to know God's word good enough to where you don't have to Google a Bible verse to, to, to tell somebody something. (laughs) <laughs> that you can remember it and take it out and just like Jesus did. As Satan fired at him these temptations, Jesus flung back God's word as a weapon. I pray that we would know that when we move out into this time in life, as we move out into this wilderness, that we'll be ready for it. Even though there's that specialized bait on the hook. This is what we need to look for. The specialized bait on the hook that we have that, that's coming our way. We need to be able to look for it. And then we need to be able to look for the way out of it. I know, so, how many people served in the military in here? How many people served in law enforcement? Now, my dad served in law enforcement for, for a very, very long time. He's in the army when I was a kid. And I know that there's, there's times where my dad doesn't like to have his back towards the door. Do you guys do the same thing? You, you, you like to be able to see the door. And then for most military and, and law enforcement guys, you, you, you want to know the exit. You want to know what's, what's the quickest exit. Well, as a Christian, you're in a battle. You need to watch the door and look for the closest exit. Because sin is going to come right through that door. And if you have your back towards it and you're just lounging around, it's going to come right up behind you and get you. But if you can see it coming, the Bible says, and and we're going to get into this next week, but the Bible talks about how God has made an escape for us. So we need to look for that. Because I don't want you to bite on that specialized bait that's on the hook for you. It's different for all of us. We all deal with different sins. Some of us probably deal with a a lot along the same lines of sin. But it's different for all of us. Don't bite. Don't bite. If you bite, you'll get the hook in the mouth. Now, I want to I call the band up, but I, I want to tell a story as they're coming up. There was a story that, uh, that, I, that I heard that, uh, and it kind of made me think about my father-in-law. My father-in-law is a, a, a guide fisherman. He's won so many tournaments. And uh, I mean, remember when I first started dating Amy, uh, <laughs> uh, Amy's dad and grandfather took me to two places. One was the gun range. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> that was not awkward or nothing. Uh, and then the second one was they took me out on the boat. 
And, you know, I was fishing with them, and, and I caught three fish, which was crazy, because I never caught any fish. And I caught three, but my father-in-law caught 30. So there's something to fishing, I guess. There's actually a technique to it, okay? Well, the story that I heard was this, this fishing guide company, right? This fishing guide company had these uh, different fishing tours that would happen. And, and so people would pay money, and they'd get a ticket, and they'd get on to this boat. And then the fishing guide would take them out fishing, well, on this boat, it has a sign that says, do not climb on the edges of the boat. Stay within the boat. Do not climb on the edges of the boat. And so as they're out fishing, as they're out into the water, one of the guys starts climbing on the boat. Starts climbing on the edge of the boat. And so the fishing guy, the main guy, the owner of the company, he gets on the loudspeaker and says, please do not climb on the boat. This young guy, full of spunk, he, he didn't listen to none of that. Ah, he said. And he kept climbing on it. He kept doing the, the tightrope walk on it until one of those waves came through and just rocked the boat just so. And this guy fell over into the water. So this water that they were in, it was not no tropical water. It wasn't a clean river that they were in. There was snapping turtles, and alligators in this river. It was not pleasant. And so as he's flopping around in the water, and these snapping turtles are coming up to snap at him, and off in the distance you see this alligator with his two eyes sticking above the water coming closer and closer and closer. What happens? The owner's son grabs a rope, and jumps into the water and grabs that young guy. He held on to the rope, though. And as he grabs this young guy, this, this owner's son, he's getting bit by the same snapping turtles as the other guy is. But he holds on to the rope, and they pull him up, pull him up back onto the boat. And the owner's son saves that young guy. And everybody's clapping and everybody's, yeah, thank God. The, the crocodiles swimming away, very disappointed. Do you know what that is? God was the owner of the company. Jesus was the guy with the rope. Us is that guy that was walking on the edge of the boat and fell off. And the Holy Spirit was that rope. Jesus came to us holding on to the Holy Spirit the whole time. Jesus experienced what we experience. And by our own sinful flesh, we fall right into temptations and traps and crocodiles and snapping turtles. But Jesus pulls us out of that. I pray today for you that you would trust the same Jesus that I trust. Because this Jesus is the new and better Adam. This Jesus is the one who's changed everything. This Jesus is the one who's created in me a heart so willing to serve him that everything can fall away and he will be right in front of me. It says in, the, in God's word that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he'll be with us into the very end of the age. There's nothing that I can do that would push him away. And I pray that you know him like I know him. I pray that you would trust him like I trust him. Jesus has been tempted in every single way that we are tempted. If you trust him, if you love him, you will experience triumph. Lord, you're mighty, you're powerful, you're wonderful, you're holy, you're magnificent. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you today. We pray, Lord, that you would call and draw people in this room to you today. We know that none of this is, is by happenstance. None of this is coincidence. There's nobody here just cause. Lord, you have created such amazing, intricate 
weavings of time and space. You bring people to places that they need to be. It's beautiful, Lord, when we who seek you find out that the whole time you've, been sought, you've sought us. So, Lord, we praise you today and we honor you today. Jesus, we thank you for that time in the wilderness, that time at the breaking point of your body where you were tempted by the devil. Lord, you didn't snap at him. You didn't shatter him in half. You answered back with God's word, knowing that we would need to know that. Knowing that we would need to know that the weapon against the devil is God's word continually. So Lord, we thank you for the, the great things that you're doing in this church. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless this church in mighty ways. We honor you and we thank you. We pray that you would call many people to you. Spirit, guide us today. If it need be a wilderness, stay with us the whole time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God will make a way. He's doing that every single day. So let's stand up. Let's sing this with the band.